Fuck it. Okay, welcome to the sixth lecture of the Shanghai Lectures. Um, Fabio, did you want to say some, some words? Okay. Uh, so we have a great program today. Um, we have uh, we're here from the University of Plymouth in the UK. Uh, so it's uh, eight o'clock uh, in the morning. Um, and we have uh, first coming up a lecture by uh, Professor Angelo Cangelosi. Uh, on language learning in children, robots, a developmental robot, robotics approach. Um, then at 9.55 we have a coffee break. And then at uh, 10.05 we'll have Rudolf Küchlin uh, with morphological computation and control, abstract concepts and future applications in medicine. Uh, at 10.45 uh, we will do a little uh, presentation of the koans, the group projects. We have a student town hall meeting um, and a student's presentation. And then we'll do a wrap up and, and try to be done by 11.30. Now I'll give the word to Angelo Candrelosi. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Martin. And thanks also to Fabio and Nathan for the organization and the invitation. And of course, thanks to all the other people around the world who are here paying attention to our lecture. As you can see from the title, the focus will be on language learning in the context of developmental robotics. And uh, most of my work, the work I will present today, it's a continuous switch between uh, psychology experiments on language learning and robotic experiments. Of course, our focus is primarily robotics, but you see how important it is to pay attention to the uh, current state of the art in language learning and language principles in uh, child development. So let me start with this example from uh, a famous paper by a philosopher of uh, cognitive science. Sorry. 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 Who, who titles the paper Gavagai. Gavagai is really an, a new ah, word, a known word, and uh, Juan imagines a scenario where you have uh, one uh, anthropologist going into a new tribe in the Amazon. Uh, the philosopher, the anthropologist, doesn't know the language, so they want to discover the meaning of words. So when they hear the sound Gavagai in the presence of a rabbit, they can guess, they can make a note in their notebook, or Gavagai probably means uh, rabbit. But we don't really know if Gavagai means rabbit, if it means eyes, parts of the, the animal, if it means rabbit, the whole animal, or if it means even carrot, because I can say in front of a rabbit to another person, carrot, to mean do we have a carrot, can we get a carrot? And of course, the, the anthropologists will try to final, uh, finalize and uh, fine tune the meanings, so if you hear the same word Gavagai in the presence of a, what we call a dog, then of course you will change the meaning in your booklet and you say Gavagai is not animal rabbit. Probably Gavagai means animals or means mammals or means uh, a type of animal with four legs and so on. Or it could still mean I, remember, part of the body. So this hypothetical problem is not really hypothetical because in practice this is what we do, what we did when we were young as babies. We had to hear these Gavagai sounds that meant nothing to us, and we have to gradually try to link the sounds to meanings, what we call meanings, to experiences. So the talk which I'm going to introduce looks at the way the, child, the children solve the Gavagai problem, let's say, using, of course, a robotics approach here. And if you look at the state of the art in language use and language uh, communication between humans and machines in the field at the moment, there are m major developments, Siri and other speech recognition systems are good examples. But if we go back to the history of artificial intelligence, we have ELISA, one of the very first in the 70s, chat a box. You could actually talk to this uh, psychotherapist called ELISA and have some kind of meaningful communication. Although, as you will see in a moment, the term meaningful really is meaningless. And let me show you why. If I ask Siri or ELISA to give me a definition of the word push, which should be a straightforward motor-based uh, word for an agent, artificial agent, a robot, or a, a human person, Ga uh, this uh, Siri system or ELISA system will give us a definition of push, which comes from the dictionary that you can easily embed in the whole program. And the dictionary says that push means to press forcefully against to move. Very abstract, generic definition, 
But this is a good reply. If I ask you to give me a definition, the system gives me a definition. But we want to challenge the system to make sure that the definition is actually meaningful, rich of meanings. So we ask to give that a definition of a sub word. So force, again, another relatively concrete or exp something that I can experience. And the answer from Siri or Eliza would be force is defined as energy or strength. We can go further. What's the meaning of energy? And Eliza will say energy means strength of force. But you can see here there is a loop, there is a link that goes back to the initial definition. So I use f energy to define force, but I need force to define energy. So if I wear a system that only relies on these words, and you can see further complex examples here, then I think we might have a problem in the sense that the robot doesn't really know meanings, the robot just bubbles back to me. In what appears to be a meaningful way, but in practice the robot has given us no demonstration or theory that there is a real understanding or shared meanings. You can see all these uh, loops are called by Stephen Harnad merry-go-round. This is the game that you have with the horses, the child on a horse, uh, going around and ending always on the same place, in the same place. So one way to get out of this merry-go-round, to start to ground meanings, is the approach of symbol grounding. The idea being that at least some of the words in your dictionary are grounded, are linked through experience, like in a baby experience or in a Gavaga experience, through seeing the world, to touching objects in the world, to pointing at words and so on, to using the body. So what you will see in my talk today is many examples of how this is done in children, how children use their hands, gestures, fingers, to learn words, and of course vision, and the body posture, and how this can be used in a robotic setup to teach a robot words for objects, words for actions, but you will see later even words for numbers, which become slightly more abstract meanings. So let me now give further context on uh, psychology, developmental psychology, and neuroscience uh, studies, which inform uh, this approach in developmental robotics. And an alternative to pre-program a dictionary like in ELISA and Siri is to have a robot, a system, that is not born with a dictionary, but rather is to slowly learn the first words. These are the future grounding upon which then you can build new lexicon. We are not saying here that you have to learn all words through experience, because you will see examples later that where you can generalize from the early words to new words. So I can learn through experience that there are animals called horses. I can learn through experience that there are shapes called horns. And then, without having ever to meet a unicorn, if they ever existed, I can invent a meaning of an animal called unicorn that looks like a horse with a horn. So language is the power of creativity, of generating new meanings, of course, once you start with the basic grounding of experience like horses and horns. This is the, uh, what we know from child psychology. You will see lots of child psychology examples in a moment. And then also we need to look at neuroscience. How neuroscience informs our development. And although we tend to say that, and this is true, that the brain is modular, we have the cortex areas in the back part of the brain for vision processing, which is separated from the part of the brain that do language processing, which is separated from the part of the brain that does motor control. In reality, people like Purve Mueller have demonstrated that the, the system is actually intrinsically interrelated. And the example that you see here, on the left of the screen, we can see the example of the homunculus. This is a representation of how the motor uh, uh, cortex, the cortex area that does motor control, separates the processing of the mouth for language and production, and also for eating, the control of the hand, big part of the brain, because we need to use hands for, to use tools and so on, and other part of the brain that does uh, uh, leg control, the lower part of the body. So the brain separates things nicely, and therefore, if we can do brain visualization, brain imaging is, um, uh, studies, where we can see when the brain is active, in the first diagram that you see, this black, uh, the brain on the black background, the first on the left, you see how the motor cortex is active when you ask the person to visualize, to imagine the meaning of words like kick, pick, and link. It's not surprised that we get red areas when it's about hand, in the hand position of the homunculus, this representation of the body. Then you have blue areas related to uh, leg control and so on. 
The most important result, though, is the diagram on the right, where you see that uh, the brain is also active, although with less intensity. The motor part of the brain uh, is active when you ask the person to make a pure linguistic judgment, which is lexical decision. Yes, no, if what you see, it's a word or not. Very straightforward, no meaning. The people are instructed to pay attention to the syntax, to the, to the lexicon, rather than to the meaning. So even when I have to make a decision if kick is in my dictionary or not, I still have to, in some way, activate or think, at least for a while, of the meaning. This is to demonstrate that a pure modular approach is not really what nature has evolved for our solution for the brain. And therefore, in our, you will see later, robotics implementation, bio inspired implementation, we are going to look at, at how we can implement this uh, interrelationship between different modalities. If we put together this expertise from neuroscience, from psychology, child psychology, cognitive psychology, of course we need to know about languages, so linguistics, robotics, computer science, then we get something called cognitive robotics, and in particular today's focus is on developmental robotics, how a child robot can gradually, incrementally uh, develop uh, complex cognitive skills. So initially you have to learn to name objects that you can see, then you have to learn uh, actions that you can perform or you can see being performed. Then you can learn properties of actions or properties of objects, so colors, for example, what we call adjectives. And then later, in this developmental com complexity-orientated approach, you will get more abstract meanings like words, for example. <coughs> Start now with this video. This is just to introduce the ICAP robot. I would assume most of the labs connected at the moment would know about the ICAP robot. This is a European-funded uh, project developed and led by Giorgio Meta and Giulio Sandini in Genoa, which is now used as a benchmark platform. And you can see in the, in the video here, the robot on the right, the simulator robot, is something that was actually developed here in Plymouth by my PhD student, Valentin Tikhanov, who is now a researcher at the IIT. And you will see examples in my talk of studies done using the ICAP simulator or the, ICAP, the physical ICAP, or sometimes the switch between the two. So let's now go back to Gavagai because we want to start showing examples of how a robot can solve the Gavagai problem like a child, like we did when we were babies, infants. So to do this, we need to look at the way psychologists have investigated language learning, and there are a principle, mechanism called language learning biases or principles. These are mechanisms that the child implicitly uses to acquire a lexicon, to learn the meaning of words and learn to use words. One of the most common uh, is called uh, shape bias. So if I see an object, I first pay attention to the shape to try to ask, uh, give a name. This, is, this was developed by, studied by Linda Smith in Indiana. And Linda Smith has also contributed to the uh, definition of the principle space bias or posture bias. The two are connected because if I, I have objects on my left space and my right space in front of me, then I need to move my posture towards the left, towards the right, to make sure that I can interact with the two objects. And in particular, she says that spatial locations and the posture related to playing with different sp spatial locations play a key role in binding, in linking new words and the meaning, the visual experience, the postural experience, and of course the auditory the word that you see. And you can do this because the child has to switch po postures to relate, to interact with things that are in different parts of the screen. What uh, it, I think Nathan will now show to you a video on the binding experiment. We call this the uh, uh, experiment on the Modi setup. You can see the video there. This is the researcher showing a baby, an 18 month old baby. This is the age in which you are started to learn language. She shows two objects for which the child doesn't know a name. And the two objects always appear first on the left and then on the right. First on the left and then on the right. It's always separate position. If you do this, you will see in a moment she will hide one object in the same part of the screen or the table where it used to appear. 
So she, in a moment, she will put the objects in a bucket, hide them from sight. Look, it's a Modi. Oh, it's a Modi. Modi. Just look at the Modi, even if we, babies, don't see the object. And the strength of this approach is that using posture and ba space bias, you can even memorize and learn the name of an object, even when the object is temporarily out of sight, but when the posture and the experience towards the left and the right is kept constant. So we say, mix the object, and she says, can you find me the Modi? And, and we can stop with the video here, Nathan, because I want to now go back to our uh, to a summary of the setup. So first you show an object on the left and a different one on the right, the previous one on the left, the other one on the right, and so on. You hide the object, you say, look at the Modi. So for the first time you say the word, the name of the object, and then you mix them and you want them to choose. If you do this, 73% of babies are able to learn, demonstrate that they can actually learn the association between Modi and the object always seen on our left. It, to demonstrate that this is really due to bias, the posture bias, you can mix the position of the two objects at the beginning where there is a 50% chance that an object will appear either on the left or on the right. And if you do this, no surprise, there is 46%, which is really chance level. There is no way a child can learn the association. So this reinforces the principle that the left-right posture bias interaction was used by the child to make this association even when the object was not visible. And we wanted to use the same mechanism, plus many more, to try to teach our ICAP, our baby robot, incrementally to learn name, names for words. And you will see in a moment Tony Morse, our collaborator, giving a demonstration. First, of the very basic principle language learning, which is called fast mapping. This is the case in which I see the object, I hear the name while I'm looking at the object, and I make the association in one go. And then later you will see an implementation where the object is hidden, but the robot is looking at the same position of the screen. Tony will uh, shake he, he, his hand to make sure that the robot looks at the position and therefore this is learned. So Nathan, you might want to start so the, the, the Modi video, Modi July 2000. And then we're going to teach it if you listen objects. to it, will give a clear explanation of the process. So this is the fast mapping example. See the object, hear the name at the same time, make an easy association. You might have noticed that the ICAP, before it's, it's told at the name of an object, it actually pays attention to things that move. This is an instinct that we program in the robot to pay attention to bright things or things that move. So when children learn the names of objects, those objects don't have to be in sight. It can be through association. So we'll show you how that works on the robot. We'll show you the object. Then we can hide the object. And Nathan, we can stop the video now. And this has shown, it's given us a demonstration, the second part, that the posture bias can also work in robots. And if you look here in the slide, uh, uh, sorry, before I look at the uh, actual results, let me say something about the architecture. How does the robot learn? The architecture is based on something called ERA architecture, epigenetic robotic architecture. This was developed by us here in Plymouth, Tony Morse, a colleague, uh, Jochen de Grief together with Linda Smith, where the top diagram includes a series of interconnected corner maps. Corner maps are the self-organizing maps, each pre-trained to classify in a topographic way 
different modalities. So we have a map here, if you can see the pointer of my mouse, the mouse. The, this is the map that classifies colors, the color spectrum. This is the central map, the most important, the body posture map, that classify body postures when the robot moves in different positions. Then you have uh, not really a map. You have a localist representation through a speech recognition system of the words. And then later you will see example where we use visual features, for example, like shape and touch uh, sensors, it, it, although they are not included in my demonstration today. The bottom part is simply a representation of a subsumption architecture that says that the robot has many competing behaviors. As I said, one is to look for things that move through a motion sentences map unless you hear a, a high priority behavior which is uh, respond to the instructions like where is, this is, and so on. These are keywords used in the interaction. The landing aspect is due to the Hapian connections linking words or units between the different corner maps. So learn to associate the meaning of, uh, let's say, blue with a sound blue will be done through Abian collections. In this case, the important element is that the body postures in the early stages of development, the map in the middle, looks like it works like a binding mechanism. This is the whole principle behind this approach of the era architecture. If we go back to the neuroscience examples, we said that although speech is separated from motor representation in the brain and from visual, in, re in reality we know that there are connections which are active and where the maps are active at the same time. So let's go back to the results. You can see this diagram with uh, blue and red uh, bar, uh, bar chart bars. The red are the robots, the other one, sorry, the red are the children's data from uh, Linda Smith example with uh, Samuelson, Melissa Samuelson, and the other ones are the robot data, as you can see that there is a nice uh, change in performance which reflect, uh, reflects the child setup. In addition, although I have no time to present this, we actually have a paper at the moment under review that demonstrates that we, even, we can even use the ICAP robot to make predictions on mechanisms that were not known in children uh, development. In particular, we focus here on the posture change. What happens if I ask the child or the robot to change position from standing to sitting, in addition to changing left and right. But let me skip this slide because of time requirements. And just a summary of how the same era architecture, epigenetic robotic architecture, has been used, it can be used to do, to implement the postal bias, to implement the fast mapping in the middle. In a moment, you will see an implementation of the mutual exclusivity. And then later you will see an implementation of some early simple forms of grammar, for example, word order, where I have verbs, adjectives, and nouns with a specific order. So in the next example, we are going to look at mutual exclusivity, another mechanism well studied in child development. The idea being that if I know, if I see three objects, I know the name of two objects, let's say an aeroplane and a train, and I see a new shape, a new object, and I don't know the name as a child, and I hear a new name never heard before. For the mutual exclusivity principle, I will assume that the new name must be linked to the new object. You will see here in this video. In this video. <coughs> I'm not sure if Nathan has the video. I mean, but I think you can see. Yeah, you don't have the video, but I hope you. I play it again. You can see the researcher here and the parent with the child. She says, can you point at the chim? And the chim is a new word. The child knows the meaning for the train and the aeroplane. And the, for the child assumes this, is the, this must be the name for the new object. In particular, the researcher who has collaborated with us, Katie Tomei, has looked at how an increasing variability of the appearance of the object breaks down the mutual exclusivity. So you can see for each set of objects, you can have a single case where you use always the same object, and the mutual exclusivity we know works well, then in the narrow variability, you change the color, one property, but you keep the same uh, shape. In the third case variable, you have changes in color, changes in shape. This is when the system breaks down. And now you can see an example of the ICAP. This is a frog. Can you show me the frog? Frog. Thank you.
So first the robot is asked to look at the frog. This is frog and tomatoes. These are two things that the, op the robot of And then the is asked to look at the hugs. This is a new object, a new name. That's why the robot looks at this strange object. I call it the octopus object. So these three videos, snapshots of results published in papers, demonstrated the same architecture as the power of explaining different mechanisms and also combining them so that you use an approach which we call cumulative learning. Like in HR, you want to accumulate different skills. This, this completes the learning of the examples in which you are learning names for objects that you see or that you saw where, when your poster was in the same uh, setup. What I want to show now is that we can increase the complexity of this uh, child robot, looking at the way children again use grammar cues, in particular in this case, word order. So I'm not sure if we have any Japanese uh, group linked at the moment, but whilst in English or in Italian we say, I eat apples, that is, we put the verb in the middle, the subject at the beginning, and the object that we are eating at the end. In Japanese, apparently, they say, I, apples, eat, if we were to translate literally, which means that uh, different languages have different word orders. But word orders, in addition to having maybe some grammatical role, also have an implica implications for language learning. If you think of the example that I'm going to mention in a moment, the dog, look at the dog. Have you seen the dog? Can you point at the dog? The word dog, which is the key word in our interaction, is always at the end in our case. So the child can use word order as a cue to structure her learning. And this is, in fact, what has been studied by Kirsten Fisher, a developmental linguist in uh, Southern Denmark University, to demonstrate the word order and other, she calls them structural cues, cues related to the structure of the grammar, how these cues are used by the child to improve uh, her language learning experience. And in particular, we are going now to look at how you can use the word order to teach a child that, for example, there are grammatical categories like adjective and nouns, and there are grammatical categories like verbs, names or actions. This is that work done by my colleague David Marocco initially in simulation. So you have two robots here, sorry, the same robot in different interaction scenarios. You have a ball that rolls, you have a cube that needs to be pushed. So roll, rolling and pushing are two different verbs that you have to learn to name and to comprehend the name of it. And of course, we do. We, our interaction is by, whilst the robot is looking at these objects, give instructions like touch ball, touch green ball, touch red ball, touch green cube, and so on. You can see that if we use three words, the last word is always the, what we call a noun, the name of the object. The first word is always the name of the actions, in this case, the instructions that, that we ask. And if there are words in the middle, this could be it would be an adjective if there are three words, the name of the caller. It would be an adjective when named, depending on the length of our interaction. But we keep the word order constant when we use many words. In addition, we take our era architecture. The diagram on the right represents this uh, corner maps linked together through the body posture. On the left, instead, we have a recurrent uh, Elman type neural network that, that is used to handle time. If we want the child robot to use what order, we need a network, an artificial neural network that handles time, and recurrent neural networks like an Elman network can do this. So we have modified our architecture by adding time-related uh, processing capabilities, and we enhance our interaction by now giving the robot a series of instructions which include different words in specific fixed orders. And Neta will now start the video that shows how you can combine together mutual exclusivity, fast mapping, word order into one interaction. Hello. This is a box. What is this? So this is fast mapping. Where is the box? This is mutual exclusivity. Where is the box? Both learned before. 
And in a moment, you will see word order cues. So you can see, Nathan, we can stop the video. You can see that the robot is capable of learning to reproduce also word in a sequence. And when the robot produces a specific order, this is related to the strength of the activation in the different maps. So I think this final video of the first part of the talk really shows nicely how cumulatively, incrementally, you can combine all these principles using the same architecture enhanced with this recurrent neural network to teach a robot in a childlike fashion, developmental robotics, developmental psychology, to teach a robot to learn the names of objects that he can see and also the names of actions that he can perform. But there is something else in language, which is how do we teach more abstract concepts? Typical examples of abstract concepts are uh, democracy, happiness. We don't we do this yet with robots, but we have done something in the past, uh, uh, words which we say go towards, the, there is a continuum between very concrete words, yellow, when I always see the same hue of the color, versus democracy, something which I can really see. But there are intermediate levels of up, up, just, up, uh, sorry, abstractness. For example, the word make or the word use. I can use a pen, very practical term. I can use a brush. I can use an idea. So you can see that the same word gradually gets a very abstract uh, component. So some work done by my collaborator, Francesca Stramandinoli, who is now a Marie Curie postdoc at the IIT in Genoa, has looked at, how, looked at this continuum bit of con uh, abstract words. Another person working in the field is Anna Borghi, the CNR in Rome, who has looked at abstract words, studied both in people and uh, in computational models. Today we are going to focus on the different types of abstract words, which are numbers. So one, two, three, four, they are abstract in the sense that I can see one apple and say one, I can see one pen and say one. So there is no consistency between what I see and what I name, because the name, the word one means a bit more than just looking at a specific object. But I can also call one and three and five odd numbers. I can call two and four even numbers, so, so more com complex entities. I can also say large and small. I can say many, few, and so on. So how can we teach a robot these abstract concepts? Again, we do developmental robotics, which means we go back to ch psychology and say, how does a child learn to count? And here are some examples. A child learns to count by using uh, her own body. So I use finger counting. And this has been demonstrated to be important in helping the child bootstrap numerical capabilities. In mathematical education, with early ages, you can use a visual representation. You can see the frog here jumping between elements when you want to represent specific concepts like adding numbers, subtraction, and so on, multiplying. And also, we use gestures, in the case of the frog, the lips, again, to help us represent these numbers. The diagram that you see on the uh, top uh, left, it's called the mental line, number mental line. This is a visualization of neuropsychology experiments that shows that we tend to, we prefer or tend to see, recognize small numbers on the left, one, two, bigger numbers on the right, five and six, and then of course this depends on the interval that you use. This is called the size effect. You will see examples in a moment. So what we have done, three different collaborators in our lab here in Plymouth have looked at the role of finger counting in, in the ICAP, uh, number learning capabilities, the role of gestures, again, in the ICAP, and also the role of the mental line. And I'm going to give you, again, brief presentations of some of the results in these three approaches. And then I can refer you to the papers or to the question and answer sessions if you want to know more details. So let's start first by looking at the role of gestures in counting. The bar chart that you see here on the bottom left shows five, the performance in five groups of children. The first group with the lowest performance, the vertical axis, the y-axis, represents how the biggest number you can count correctly. So in the first case, it's called the no gesture. This is really the passive counting setup. You have a child 
sitting at a table, and a few objects in turn are put on the table, and there is a voice that counts the objects. So if there is one object, the voice will say one. If there are three objects, the, vo the voice will say one, two, three. The child has nothing to do just to passively, in some way, learn to count. And after, at the end, the child is asked to tell the researcher how many objects are on the table. So if you do this, the performance is about uh, two. The child can learn to count up to two. If instead, the same child group of age, you keep different children but the same age group, you ask the child, in the first case, you, the child sees a puppet, the researcher holding a puppet, which points at objects, so it's a pointing gestures. The third column is the child allowed to point at the objects herself. So if you do this, you can see there is a significant increase in the performance of the counting. And further, if you want the child to be even better at counting, same age, with better performance, is when you ask the puppet, or you ask the child, to touch the objects being counted. So you hold the first <coughs> apple, one, you hold the second apple, two, and so on. So if the puppet or the child can touch the object, you get an, in, an increase in performance. Now, let's see how we can <laughs> use the same strategies by teaching our ICAP, this abstract concept of now one, two, three, and four. You will see here a video of the counting exercise. The ICAP uses gestures in this setup to count different objects. <laughs> this is a slow video because in reality the studies were done in simulations. So what you see is a testing with a physical robot of the studies done in simulation. And in the simulation, as you know, you need to keep uh, space and objects very constant. That's why it looks a bit uh, slow, the representation. The architecture on the left is a Nelman recounted architecture that in input receives vision of the objects, but also receives, very important in some conditions, proprioceptive feedback in, in one case. In this specific case, is the vision of the gesture location of the puppet, let's say, of the partner in the interaction. And when we show here the results, the performance in the y-axis, in the first case, we have vision plus gestures minus, means this is the case where you only allow the child robot to learn to count by looking at objects without any gestures input. So the extra input to the network, which represents the gesture performed by the puppet, let's say, the partner, is not shown. Not shown. Instead, in the middle, you can see the case where you combine the two together, you can see a significant improvement, even better than the one that we ob observed in children. So first study done by Marek Ruczynski here for his Marie Curie PhD was to demonstrate that uh, you can use gestures to improve the performance of an ICAP counting. In the second, ex I have two more examples. Uh, Martin, how are we doing with time? You have about, what, 15 minutes. Okay, so I have time to present the second set study and then the third one, which is the example that we have on, on our uh, finger counting. This is called the replication of the SNARC effect, N-S-N-A-R-C, Spatial Numeric Association Response Code. I mentioned this before. If we, we tend to prefer a recognized faster, smaller objects or smaller numbers if they appear on the left part of the screen or if we have to respond to the object property, let's say, odd or even, by using the left hand. Numbers which are bigger tend to be recognized faster if they appear on the right part of the screen or if we use the right hand to make a decision on the odd or even uh, correspondence. And plus variations of this knack effect. This, this creates the, our perception of mental line. But let me say that this is culturally specific in the sense that for cultures like, let's say, English, where you read left to right and you count typically left to right, you will be faster with smaller number on the left faster with bigger number on the right. If you are a culture that reads the other way around, right to left, then you will be faster at recognizing big, small numbers with the right. So the mental line is related to the cultural experience of reading and counting. And if you go to a culture like Israeli, where you read in one direction, right to left, so my understanding is that, and, but the numbers are actually written, you change order, the direction for the numbers, uh, left to right, then you get an even more confusing snack pictures, let's say. A very well studied phenomenon. Last year, we celebrated the uh, 20th anniversary of the discovery of this uh, snack effect. So what we did, we know space is important. 
that's why we have this mental line. We want to help our child robot to use space to facilitate the acquisition of this concept on numbers and mental line. So in the diagram that you see here on the left, you have the left architecture that uh, connects uh, number perception, one, two, three, four, into decisions, for example, odd or even. The rest, the response output, is to decide odd even when you see a number. And you can do this in a very abstract way, like you would do with a Siri or Eliza example. But you can see that there is an additional bit of the network on the right, which connections link in the two. This is the part of the network that learns that there is left and right space. If you look at the video of the simulated ICAP, you can probably see the red ball object appearing in different parts of the screen, and the robot has to learn to point or reach objects in different parts. And you do this before you teach the robot to count, the idea being that you want the robot to build a map of space made of left space, right space, and space in the middle, where there is, of course, an overlap of space. So we, developmentally, we grow a child which can have a mental map, uh, uh, sorry, uh, with motor bubbling can have a map of space. It can also learn to map this abstract concept of numbers one, two, three, four. We don't use gestures here, but you can imagine we could add the gestures. And then we sit our ICAP, like we do with psychology students in psychology labs. We sit our ICAP in uh, the in front of a computer. Nathan, maybe you have the video, the Marek video on number counting. If not, you can look at the video in my presentation. You can see that the robot has, has to press the two buttons. There it is. You make you assign left and right to odd and left, uh, odd and even, let's say. The robot sees the number and has to press. Uh, what matters here, the, in the video pressing doesn't really matter, but the actual reaction time in the computational model, this neural network uh, modules, is decided by the reaching of a threshold in the activation function. You can, of course, invert the two mappings. And what you see there in the charts appearing in the corner is this, the time taken to respond, where longer time means a higher uh, column here. Once you accumulate all this, you have to calculate the differential between the times in the two space. That's what happens here. And you get the slope. The slope is really the demonstration that there is snack. If there is no left to right mapping or speed change, then you will get a flat line. So if you go back to the slides, the modeling results show a very clean uh, slope of the snack effect. That's because in our robot, things are, there is less noise and things are more clear, and there is no noise actually if you have a simulator. And then in the left part, you see the more variable people data. These are not children, these are adults, although snack is also happening with children. This shows this uh, uh, sli uh, slightly smaller effect of the snack effect. So this shows that by linking space and uh, abstract concept like odd and even, you can help the child robot, in this case, to uh, acquire this concept, but also ground the concepts, abstract concepts, in the sensory motor experience and representation. And my final study will be on finger counting, because we said that we are, we use three examples demonstrating the link between uh, abstract number cognition and more practical sensory motor experience or gestures, the mental line because of the left and right space representation, and now finger counting. So we all know again that we do finger counting, and in different culture, cultures, different, there are different strategies to count. The order of fingers changes. So what we did, we wanted to help our ICAP to also use finger counting to again better understand the meaning of words, and if you really understand the meaning of one and two quantities, two being twice one, four being twice two, and so on, you can then get the ICAP doing some mathematical operation for you. And you will see a demonstration in a moment. So we take our simulated ICAP initially. We have now done work with the physical ICAP. Uh, this work has been done by Vivian de la Cruz from Messina University, the collaboration with Sicily, and Alessandro Di Nuovo, who is a postdoc here with us. So we, take, we can ask one ICAP to only count the, uh, using fingers. So, so no actual sounds. The robot has to learn to sequence their, uh, its fingers in a specific way. A different ICAP can be asked to bubble linguistically the sounds of 
linguistic number sequences. So one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Fewer sounds, no finger use. Of course, we combine the two together in dif different type of robots where you have the motor sequence and the number of words all learned together. And we want to see what different does it make. You can already guess that I'm going to tell you that yes, if we put the two things together, the robot learns better. So no need to show you a diagram that demonstrates this, and this is, of course, the case. I think there is a more important result here. If you look at this slide, the top diagrams, we are going to look inside the brain of the robot. The first diagram on the left, these are called uh, uh, cluster uh, diagram. It basically represents the, the distance of the representation of the different numbers. And if you look at the first chart here on the top left, you can see that one is next to two, two is next to three, three is next to four, and so on. You see in reality that our robot is not really that good because then five is next to eight, then six, seven, nine, and 10. So nine and 10 are right. There's a bit of confusion for the robot between uh, six, seven, and eight, which is fine because with children or with people, you never get 100% performance. So the robot can learn to do things r roughly right in this case. This is the representation of a robot that can, at the same time, has been trained to count with the fingers and count verbally. So this is the robot that integrates the two, which has a better performance. The robot, the other diagrams show the case, for example, in which the robot only learned two bubble whatless sequences. So if you look at the second diagram, one is next to nine, nine is next to five, which doesn't make sense. It actually makes sense for the robot because the robot uses this strange representation of distance between quantities, which is enough for the robot to say one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. The sequencing, the bubbling of the sequence is perfect. This is really the merry-go-round example, which I showed you before. The robot can bubble to you. You get the impression the robot knows how to count, but really there is no internal organization of meanings, which reflects, in this case, because they are numbers, a kind of sequence and relative rela relations. Therefore, if we take the first ICAP on the left, which can count where number meanings are actually sequential, the same robot can be used to perform numerical operations with the correct answer. Because I can ask the robot first to activate in memory the, me the representation, the meaning for the sound two, the robot puts this in memory. Then I can add a new meaning in the operation. Let's say another two. The robot uses the previous activation state. It now uses the same weights to produce the second activation state, which is two. But because two is a specific numerical meaning in the mental representation of this neural network, in this actual neural network activation values, then as a result, you get the accumulation of the two activations, which result in four. Because we said that four is a relation which two, like two to one, which is, let's say, doubling. So nice demonstration that without further learning, you can use a real robot that relies on finger counting, sequencing, grounding. The grounding of numbers is in the finger sequence. And the finger sequence in our body is fixed. So I'm forced to learn that the, my motor auditory bubbling is actually linked to a physical sequencing. And this helps the child to have a real presentation on numbers. Real in the sense, of course, within a robotic context, is actually used by the robot to perform some operations in a correct way. And now I think I can conclude my talk first with a take home message. What I would like you to remember, in, if I meet you in, in a conference in a few months time and you say, Angelo, I, I enjoy, I didn't enjoy your talk, I will ask you, what do you remember by my talk? And then you, hopefully you will re tell me that you remember that we developed this ear architecture, epigenetic robotic architecture, which has been used to model incrementally a series of mechanisms. I briefly mentioned also the embodiment aspects in cognition, in particular the body as a cognitive hub hypothesis. This is the idea that you have this posture map in the middle, which allows the robot to bind to link different modalities, speech, sound, vision, uh, shape perception, color perception, and so on. Also, you saw an example of a simulation in the same robot of multiple developmental phenomena. And then you saw, at least in, one, in two cases, we can actually compare performance in artificial robots with performance in uh, real data in, from psychology. Even include the example, which I didn't have time to discuss in detail, 
that we can actually use the computational model to predict language learning phenomena which have been demonstrated to happen in children through experiments uh, run by Linda Smith at uh, the lab in uh, Indiana. This is for the achievements. Of course, there is uh, still a lot to do. So in terms of open challenges, we want this cumulative learning to be really better and more continuous. In our case, although the robot uses the same architecture for many language learning uh, mechanisms and, and phenomena, in reality, when we do number learning, we change the architecture completely. So we really wish to have the same architecture, modular and interconnected like in a brain, that performs more, more than one behavior. Another directional research, this is a project that we are running in Plymouth called uh, Babel, in collaboration with Pulver Mueller, the guy who discovered the, the effect of the hick, lick, and pick uh, in, in representation of the meaning of words in the brain, we're looking at a more realistic representation using spiking neural network of these capabilities in uh, robots, also using something called neuromorphic engineering. We have a system called Spinnaker, which implements in physical hardware architectures a spiking structure, an event-based uh, representation of spikes in the brain. And another area of, uh, of future development, this is something we are also working on, it's a project called Robot Era. We want to implement that these mechanisms studied just for developmental robotics in real interaction studies between human and people. In particular, we have a set of robots being used on studies with uh, uh, elderly in their homes. So this is a summary of the achievements and things to do. And uh, before I conclude, let me say that I'm giving here a presentation, but the work I'm presenting is being possible because first we have some kind funders like the European Union, the UK EPSRC, the Marie Curie European Scheme, and also funding from the US Air Force, which allows us to really uh, perform the experiment, demonstrate what an ICAP can do. And then you see on the right there lots of names of people who have actually done the hard work. And I would like to mention here specifically again Mare Kluczynski for the number counting, Alessandro and Vivian for the number finger counting, Tony Morse, you saw the video for language learning plus other collaborators like David de Marocco and so on. And I think I can stop here. Okay. And uh, you tell me if there are questions. So I guess Martin and Nathan can help me. Yeah, so we open the floor for questions. We still have uh, a few minutes before the coffee break. So if you have a question. Yeah, actually, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, so if you have a question, just raise your hand or open your microphone. Uh, hi, this is Rolf, uh, this time from Osaka. I, I don't know whether, whether you can see me, it's not important. Um, yep. Thank you very much, uh, Angelo, for a very uh, uh, inspiring talk. And I think it's really impressive the way you're getting actually the robots to learn something. And uh, you mentioned you, you were using kind of neural networks for this purpose as internal mechanisms. Now I was wondering what it is that you actually have. I mean, you can't learn anything from nothing, right? So basically you have to provide the robot with something. And the question is a bit, what is this something? Is that, let's say, basically just an empty neural network where you provide the architecture, the connectivity, initial connectivity, or do you have to supply something in addition? Uh, can you give us a bit of a feel for that? Thank you, thank you, Rolf. Uh, let me say, let me give you two answers, let's say. First is, we of course provide a robot with some capabilities that we assume from the studies in the literature which are essential to perform the task. For example, in the MODI setup, we have a non-neural implementation of an instinct to look at things that move. So to, there is an intrinsic mechanism for attention, which is pre-programmed, which uses a motion sensitive map. So non-neural network, just a mechanism to identify where movement is happening in, this, in space. In addition, we assume that the robot has to be able to represent body posture in a continuous way, a bit like creating an homunculus map. You have different body parts or different posture representing a kind of continuum. That's why we pre-program the neural network for the corner maps to represent a posture, continuum, 
and then you have the color, continuum, shape, uh, representation, and so on. So we assume these are the starting points that you need to have to be able to do this. And then the real interesting bit, I think, in this specific setup is the Hebian learning, associative learning, which is really the part of lexical development where you learn to associate uh, different modalities initially. So th this, is, this is to say that we don't only use neural networks. At the same time, we just choose different mechanisms depending sometimes on which one works best. Sometimes, though, this is the second part of the answer, is that we choose neural networks because there are some benefits. One is learning. The other one is because, uh, this is me being a trained in psychology, we are really looking here at meaning representations. And I have two strategies. I can sit in my uh, in front of my computer and then create a vector, a variable, an array of data in my a program which I called meaning, and then an array of data which I called words. But for me, if I do this, I feel I'm doing the merry-go-round because I'm creating meanings, I'm linking meanings, and these are all uh, symbolic, we say symbolic meanings. The advantage of a neural network is that I, Angelo Cangelosi or Tony Morse, don't have to decide if the meaning is rabbit, if it's ear, if it's uh, animal, if it's mammal, if it's canine, and so on. I have a, a distributed system that, through experience of visual stimuli, can self-organize its own representation using this uh, PDP, this parallel distributed process mechanism. The same for the case of the number and finger counting. I don't have to force my own interpretation of what's the meaning of one and two in an abstract way. I let a distributed system to self-organize itself the meaning. That's why I have the nice result that finger counting helps to structure my similarity and clustering of similarities in, in the network, which is different in the case of motor bubbling. So there are advantages in using uh, this kind of learning mechanism for learning, but also for not allowing the researcher to impose her own representation of meanings, which is symbolic. OK, any, any more questions? Yes, uh, I have a question. Um, so, uh, would uh, having uh, a soft implementation, uh, soft robot implementation, uh, uh, help you in, in, under some respect, or do you think that for this kind of study it is not necessary? Probably, with the current mm -hmm. studies, I'm just thinking what we presented. Uh, maybe, of course. It would have definitely increased, you know, the performance and the quality, but probably it wouldn't have been this crucial in the sense that the type of interaction that we model is not really that rich from a sensory, from a tactile or sensory point of view, I think, interaction. Because the gesture, if you have a rigid body or a soft body, probably wouldn't have a big difference. Probably if we start to look at the richness in finger counting, maybe, or, you know, computational uh, morphological computation type approaches would be a better representation for the input to this neural system to try to self-organize the representation which is linked to not only to this artificial discrete representation of fingers but a more subtle and maybe more dynamic representation of fingers. So in, in some studies this is definitely useful. Maybe if we go towards more complex representation and investigation of meanings then this is the case where soft bodies, uh, soft material can actually make a big difference. I see, because uh, uh, another similar question is that uh, you, you this, uh, this, uh, I think it is another challenge, no? but uh, after you distribute the processing um, within a, 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 so among many uh, uh, neural networks, uh, in principle, if you want to follow uh, the morphological computation approach, we also think of distributing part of the property in the dynamics of the body itself. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. know if you have an idea of that. Uh, I mean, you already did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It, it is a, uh, I think this is something really we should pay more attention to. And in, in some sense, your previous question on the soft body would actually enrich the interaction. Therefore, you can offload some of the computation uh, to 
you know, to the interaction, to the to this uh, coupling of the body and the robot and its uh, central system. In our case, is a neural network. So definitely something to look at. Maybe we should talk afterwards, Fabio, <laughs> and see how we can do this. Hi, um, I have a question. Verena from Berlin. Okay. Hi, Angelo. Um, Hi, Verena. Concerning your um, your work on uh, gestures and numbers, I was wondering whether you did any studies or are you aware of any studies um, that looked at the influence of the of the body of the robot um, towards uh, counting and representation of numbers. For example, if the robot has only four fingers on each hand, would it change um, its representation of the number system or um, if the number representation is not linear, for example, if you look at the, the times of the day, 24 hours of the day, where you have a circular representation, um, are there any studies on that? Yeah, yes. So you are putting together three elements of the number uh, experiments. In terms of you know representation, they use, for example, the clockwise uh, representation. In the snack effect that Marek developed, he actually looked at different cultural implementation of this phenomena. And in snack effect, there are also mechanisms that refer to the use of the clockwise representation. So Marek did something. We are writing the paper on this. So we have looked at alternative representation, in this case, to represent also alternative cultures. We have the left to right culture versus uh, right to left. For the finger counting, we actually had to implement a very unusual representation of finger counting, because for those that work with the ICAP, the last two fingers the smaller ones are actually controlled by the same uh, joint. The, for the eye cap, almost it's four fingers. So what Alessandro did cleverly is he found a finger counting uh, strategy used in the American Sign Language, which uses a specific combination of fingers, which uh, you can uh, rely on this redundant, uh, let's say, two degrees of freedom. So if this was really a technical solution for us when we have to do the study with the physical robot. With the simulator, you can do what you want in some way. So we have looked at this for gestures. Uh, I don't remember exactly the, the, the part of the question you asked, but uh, let me say what we have discussed uh, together with Marek, although Marek now finished the PhD and, and is working in, in a company, is that uh, you can, we have data where we see that the performance of a, ro of a child which sees a puppet counting is slightly different for the performance of a, of a child which performs the, the touching or the gesturing herself. So what we have planned is to use a, a combination of uh, Jordan and Elman networks for people not familiar with this type of neural network. Jordan network is a network that inputs back in the input uh, uh, layer the motor output units. So this would represent the case in which I, child, use my own input to point or to gesture with objects. This is the child gesturing and touching setup. This is different from what we implemented, where the input comes from a puppet. So you have a representation of posture that comes from somebody else. So we have the machinery to do this. But of course, we need the, the grants and the time and the people to be able to expand this. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK. So if, if there's no more questions, then maybe we, we go for a coffee break now. And then maybe we, we come back at 10 past. Is that OK with Fabio? Yeah, OK. So let's Ten, uh, And we will now, we will now give a, a brief uh, introduction to the, um, the koans, the group projects that uh, the students uh, will be doing. So if I can. Maybe this will disconnect. The yeah, so can you stop sharing, Nathan? Okay. So, um, for the uh, student <coughs> group. For student group projects, uh, we started last year to to introduce the uh, the koans as a way of, of, of assessing 
uh, having some, some, some type of assessment uh, of the students and also to, to let the students apply some of the concepts um, that we learn about from, from, from the book and, and in the class. Um, and where the, the, the term koan here means uh, from, from Zen practice, something to provoke a doubt, uh, some, some kind, of a, kind of a challenge. Uh, rather than being a, a so rather than being a group project or a project where you have a definite answer that you have to get correct, uh, this is more of an open challenges uh, where we we invite you to to explore these concepts and, and um, try to come up with interesting uh, solutions uh, and then present it to the other students. Um, last year uh, we had. Uh, quite a lot of nice uh, projects going on. We had projects uh, simulating a, uh, the passive dynamics of a manta ray wing. Uh, we had uh, some self-organizing uh, structures uh, and, and controllers. We had um, little uh, mobile robots uh, performing things like the Swiss robots, but slightly differently in virtual environment. Uh, we had um, adaptive controllers learning to use um, uh, proximity sensing based on the collisions they have in the environment, etc. And so we had a, um, and then um, all of this was 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 done by by student groups of uh, three to five students from all the different sites. Okay. So we'll try to do something similar this year. Um, you can find examples of last year's project. They're still on the website. So if you go to the uh, under the lecture tab, there's a a, a koans for uh, group projects. If you click on that. You get a page with all the, the, the projects from last year. You also have a link to a Google Plus page we have and a YouTube uh, site where we uh, put all the presentations from last year. So you can have a look there and to see um, the types of things that people came up with last year. Uh, for this year, um, we will basically publish the list of the different koans. You'll be selecting one of these, each of you. Um, it will be published on Tuesday, um, the 25th of November. Um, so that's a coming Tuesday. Then you'll have up till the end of November to select one koan. So we'll give you a probably a Google uh, shared Google document where you can put up your name on one of these koans. Uh, we'll then put you together uh, into groups, international groups, and you'll then um, be working with, together with this group, uh, providing two um, mm, deliverables. One is a preliminary design report uh, towards the uh, middle end of December. Um, which will be um, quite quite brief, but just to get you started, and then we'll have the group presentations at the end of January. The, um, oh, that's you. <laughs> anyway. So for the grading, uh, we basically say that the preliminary design report should be 25%. Uh, uh, so it's basically a kind of uh, a very concise little document saying what your ideas have been, what are your plans, and how far you've gotten so far which will be graded by your, your teaching assistant. So each of you will have one teaching assistant assigned to your group that will help you along. You can also ask, of course, other teaching assistants that might have other uh, experiences uh, uh, or get help from outside. Um, then the group presentations uh, will be, uh, typically we try to, do, well, we tried last year to do it via Google Hangouts. We'll probably do something similar this year, we'll see. We're experimenting with different technologies uh, for doing this. And will be evaluated by a panel of teaching assistant professors, etc. Uh, but you should really not be intimidated by this. Um, this is, um, it's, it's really, uh, we, we're as interested in you in seeing what you can come up with, and there's really no right answer here. So, so, so please just, just um, try to, 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 to be, you know, be brave and, and like, explore as much as you can and come up with something interesting. Uh, and we were quite lenient anyway in, in the grading. It, it, uh, so you, don't, you, don't, you shouldn't be intimidated at all. And there's also, we'll, you'll be paired together with <coughs> students on all different levels, from bachelor to PhD. Uh, so, so you'll have the support you need to, to complete the project, I think. Um, good news, you will be able to get a, a personal license for Cyberbotics Webbot. It's a very powerful um, simulator for robotics. Um, so you'll get a personal license for WebOps Pro for the semester. Uh, and the way we do this is that you can register now uh, on their website, download a, a version, uh, and do a 30-day trial of WebOps Pro. So you can just do that straight away. Uh, when you register with them, just make sure that you use the same email address as you used when you registered for the Shanghai Lectures uh, website account. And if you use another one, uh, no problem, just, just, just let us know. Um, but we need to know that to be able to extend your license. 
uh, and then there will be the license will be extended until the end of semester. Um, if you have any questions, um, pay attention particularly to the website. Uh, on Tuesday, as I said, everything will be published. You should check out the website on the Koan page, and you can then select your Koan and uh, get started on your project. Um, I, would, I would suggest that you do it as soon as possible, even before the 30th of November. And what we'll probably do is to just assign groups uh, as you start registering uh, so you can get started as soon as possible. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask, um, um, contact us by email. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, are there any questions from the students um, in the global lecture hall? Just raise your hand or open your microphone. OK. Well, if there's no questions, we, as I said, we will send out an email to all the sites uh, before Tuesday. And on Tuesday, you can check out the website for the koans. Um, we will now have a student town hall meeting. Fabio, do you want to take over this? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 first, I, I want to say that uh, these koans are actually in, in the spirit of the things practice. So the idea is that the, the challenge is uh, hard enough to force you to really understand uh, uh, the basic concept. And as uh, uh, Martin pointed out, uh, um, we don't have exact solutions for the question. So you feel really free to to, to propose your your, your idea. Uh, well, what's uh, and now let's enter into the town hall meeting. No? What's a town hall meeting first of all? Um, the town hall meeting is a, a New England American tradition of kind of uh, based democracy. Uh, so the, in the, in the, at the beginning of New England, people use it, and sometimes they still use to do that, uh, to, to meet uh, in the town hall. So in the biggest, in the town uh, uh, center, biggest building, to discuss uh, informally the issues uh, of, of the community. So as we are a community where actually students are um, the most, maybe the most important part, um, the idea is to, to have a kind of a, um, round of a free where students can have their opinion on about how we should organize the lecture uh, because uh, you may you may notice uh, that we are all. Most of us are following the lectures uh, into physical hall, and uh, we all we, we gather, we build uh, a global lecture hall. Actually, something that I noticed is that every year, so we had the streaming of the lectures two years in a row, and what happens is that uh, the, when the, um, the streaming becomes more or less trustable, uh, many students uh, disappear from the from the physical lecture hall. So this is, is, is interesting. No, uh, I mean, but uh, this would be to due to the fact that we don't have uh, an interaction. I mean, um, it's this is typical, and I think that like the the number. You no, know, uh, Angelo, uh, an hour ago, uh, what to the fact that depending on your culture. You tend to put the right or the last, depending on how you use to count. No? Uh, depending on your culture, you 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 have different attitude to um, with respect to talking properly. No? There's some culture. Uh, look into the Western culture. In, in Southern Europe, people are usually scared of talking in public during a lecture. Why, for instance, in the U.S. Students uh, sometimes uh, use it to, to get very uh, naive questions, but uh, what, uh, what there are no naive questions? Uh, I mean, any, um, any, until you don't really grasp the concept, you, you will raise naive questions. But this is the process of learning. Uh, so what uh, uh, I would like to do, we would like to do today is uh, let's uh, just uh, uh, listen to some opinions side by side about uh, what uh, you think uh, uh, we should do to, to have more, more interaction. I mean, not uh, uh, um, 
what the, the jargon they call the frontal lecture. Now there is a supposed authority, this kind of authority, which is the professor or the lecturer, which tell you without interruption is what is due or reward and you listen. And maybe at the end you, you can raise some polite questions, right? Uh, this is good, so it's the standard way to, to do lectures. But we also would like to have uh, interruption, for instance. So you should be feel free to interrupt. And uh, we should uh, leave enough space for you to, 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 to raise your questions. Uh, sometimes, in, some, in particular in the guest lecture, uh, we, we, we have heard uh, concepts which are not trivial. No? Uh, I mean, uh, from, so talking about the molecular pathway in the cell, is something that you already heard about it, so you understand what it, that it, it means. But you, if you didn't, uh, the first question that you should arise at the end of the lecture, or even during the lecture, is uh, like Rolf did. No? Well, but what do you mean by that? No? Because it's absolutely normal that you don't understand uh, a huge part of what is said. Uh, not if you mean as an understanding really. So, uh, so now I, I want to open the floor and uh, to ask, uh, for instance, uh, um, I don't know, in, in, I, I go uh, round robin on the um, on the screen that I see. For instance, uh, Francesco, what do you think? Francesco, your suggestions to uh, you are the first, I'm sorry, you are the first, I'm following the, the list on the screen. What you should do, in your opinion? No, for, for now I have, uh, I have no suggestions. Uh, no, you should have found What is the no. no, I don't the know. stupid one. Because Francisco, is, for example, is a typical uh, serious person who never talked about uh, having a good understanding of the situation and so So, and Osaka, uh, Osaka? There are two Osaka, actually. Uh, since I'm Fabio, no. since, since I'm sitting in Osaka, and obviously I'm not quite a student, but yeah. can I nevertheless make a suggestion? Sorry? Can I, yes, since I'm not a student, can I still make a suggestion? Of course. Of course. So I think one point is that when lecturers are lecturing, you know, they just, and I know that from my own experience, they just go on, you know, like, they go on. And they're very hard to interrupt. So I think we should come up with a system in which the lecturers can easily be interrupted. And so that lecturers are attentive to sort of interruption cues. And I think that's one of the problems. You know, they go so quickly over these things and they just keep talking and then it feels like very impolite to actually just, you know, interrupt. So we need a system in which lecturers can easily be interrupted. And I think maybe then the lectures will, you know, not follow the pre-prepared path, but I think they would be uh, e more easy to understand if students could ask questions, you know, just very basic questions. What do you mean by this term? What do you mean by this term? Uh, I think that's often, you know, really missing. So I think thinking of a system how lecturers can be interrupted and sort of getting the lecturers also to, to react to these interruption cues. This is a good suggestion. So, uh, so I, I again follow the round robin, so now it's Plymouth uh, in, in the first position. Suggestions from Plymouth? Yeah, we have a couple here. You want to go, Ricardo? Uh, because I'm from Brazil, so English is not my first language. So one suggestion, in my opinion, would be to use text messages, not only speak to the microphone and to the camera to ask questions to the lecturer. This is also a good point. So you mean text questions? 
Yes, because it's a lot easier to ask a hard question by text than stand up and, you know, put your face in the camera <laughs> and ask a question that you are not sure if it is a silly question or a good question. Mm -hmm. Ah, this could be uh, an idea. We, we may, for instance, uh, show the. We may show the, the question board uh, during the question session. So I mean, you may type the question, and, and we may show in the screen uh, the, the, the question board. So we we have a kind of direct uh, um, direct uh, translation, so people can keep it. Uh, uh, for the yep. I speak, you, you may write it. It's a good one. Mm. So, next one is okay. There is another Osaka where people is very silent. And, uh, Osaka U, uh, U uh, virtue, Osaka sites connected. So, but okay. An, an opinion from Chiba? Oh, yes. Uh, about this uh, text messages and so on and interrupting. Basically, I noticed that in, 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 in screen sharing, the switch screen sharing, there is the hand raising option. Could that be used? Yeah. Yes, I, I, this is uh, because I think we are also technicalities now. Because as, as we notice every time, uh, so sometimes I mean today I was have been connected for half an hour at the right moment of the start of the lecture. I lost the connection for two minutes. Right. So some, from time to time we still have uh, this kind of limitation. And also the tools we are actually banking the tools like Adobe Connect and video conferencing to do to build this as well. But you, Race and the function of Adobe is a, uh, is a very good idea, I think. So, uh, Warsaw? An opinion Hello. from Warsaw? Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, can you hear me right now? Okay, uh, so actually we have a kind of big problem because we are dealing with physicists, and I am personally yeah. both. Uh, I graduated from physics and from telecommunication department, and some physicists are a bit overtrained with mathematics, and uh, to them most uh, lectures, uh, at least some topics, seems to be kind of trivial. So it's not so easy to convince them to different uh, methodological thinking. Uh, yes, so from this perspective. Uh, I have some kind of problem of uh, with interaction with some students or with, let's say, with uh, to convince with some professors as well. So there's a kind of um, you know um, in Poland we have right now two uh, departments of physics uh, connected to Shanghai Artificial Intelligence Lectures. One is uh, University of Warsaw because I'm speaking from Faculty of Physics. And second uh, side is uh, um, Technical University of Krakow, and uh, my colleague uh, Radek Kicza is also a physicist. So uh, we are trying to grasp problem of artificial intelligence, um, having uh, physics backgrounds and physics methodology. So that's uh, what I want to indicate. So, um, but especially uh, previous week, uh, this guest lecture was really. Uh, was really uh, inspirative uh, for, for, let's say, at least to me and to, 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 to Radek Kecha. Uh, we think this can be also uh, given to physicists as well. Of course, today's lecture was, was also good, but particularly we remember last week's le guest lecture. That's what I want to say. OK, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> Actually, I think it's your theoretical physics. No, I mean, because. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about uh, um, 
about uh, glitch is uh, uh, it, 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 it's a glitch. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I, I don't read your comment as uh, that you want more equations, uh, because actually um, this is a terrible issue, because uh, of course you don't, uh, you may have different approaches, no? but uh, if you don't know don't grasp the con basic concepts, uh, it, it's also not very useful to give you the key of uh, mathematical data. What we uh, usually do and most get the uh, uh, references. Now, if you check uh, the PDF of the you find a range of references. But today, you have, and you have uh, in the literature, you can find the, the mathematical details. Uh, don't to, to keep the lecture as not qualitative, as conceptual as possible to allow a wide trust. The idea is that we also want to, so you have enough points, you have enough pointers to the literature, to and also the, the hard mathematical score of the presentation. Another thing is that of course, if you have more finance interaction is that actually different people coming from different uh, different different uh, just we want to know some equation no? for instance today there was a, a lot uh, we were in the very last uh, in the last uh, lecture, there were a lot uh, of uh, mathematical details that were hidden in uh, In Angelo's presentation, there are a lot of details that have been uh, I, uh, hidden by the presentation. Of course, uh, 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 online or offline to, to ask for the details. I, I think that people from the universities will have a different question. Uh, of course, we start of having a, a, a very variegated uh, is a challenge in itself. Huh? But, uh, uh, raising questions uh, is a way to um, orient the discussion and show other people that you have a certain answer. No? Because we talk about the intercultural the sense of uh, uh, coming from different culture, uh, reading from left to right or right to, to, to left. But different culture, uh, being a physicist, being an engineer, being a medical doctor, so these are, those are also different. Sorry. And I kind of uh, that, uh, uh, underline this, uh, in, yeah, um, uh, I don't know. So maybe um, I, I'm sorry. I, I was just quoting this I don't know if we uh, uh, we. So this is what the point. You already have some good suggestion. I don't know if you have some suggestion from Russia, from Moscow. Moscow, what do you think? Moscow? Thank you. Moscow. Hello. Uh, can you hear us? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. We would like to propose a suggestion, like we notice in uh, Adobe Connect there is a number of icons indicating whether we raise a hand or whether we agree, disagree or uh, applause. So uh, our students suggested just use them to indicate our, um, our hand, for example, our question, because otherwise sometimes uh, like we raise a hand and we don't understand whether you see us or not. That's, that's the question of like interrupting the lecture, which all uh, started. Uh, Madrid? Any suggestion from Madrid? 
Что это было? We actually don't have real suggestions, but um, from my point of view, I think that sometimes when the speakers make a global question, it's a bit difficult to, to answer. So maybe you can point the questions to a specific site from time to time. So students um, are pushed to participate in that question, students from that particular site. Yeah, uh, this is also a, a good uh, suggestion about a bit linked uh, over dictatorship, but uh, I, I, no, this requires that uh, the teaching assistant on the site uh, are actually somehow um, organizing the interaction from the site, and which is for sure helpful. No, I, I see what you say. In fact, today we are having more interaction than usual because I am more or less pointing side by side. And the polite, polite person is more or less forced to, to answer this case. Thank you. From, so, a comments from uh, Berlin? Um, basically, we, we also discussed comments that, that were already mentioned, so directing the attention to a particular site or asking questions to a particular site, and also using um, texting um, so students can ask. Um, Oh, so what's your suggestion? What do you do? Yeah, so it would be good if each student could actually ask the question himself or herself. It's easier that way because otherwise we have to always communicate with our coordinator and then interrupt the speaker. So it's no, I see. No, sorry, I, I think I missed this last comment. May you repeat? It would be nice if each student could uh, send text messages individually and not go through the local coordinator. Uh, this is also good. It's more spontaneous. Yeah, I, it's smartphone. Or <laughs> yeah, for example, being connected to the site somehow through the smartphone or computer and just being spontaneous. Yeah, this might uh, be less uh, easy to, to do, but uh, I think that, uh, no, what we could do is, since I don't think we have a limit to the number of people connected in Adobe, in Adobe uh, Connect, I think uh, we may allow to you to connect to uh, Adobe. At least um, for the that something you should check. Huh? But yeah. uh, it would be, because, uh, another channel is um, is uh, the Facebook page. So that's for sure support a lot of uh, interaction. Or is the, there any way Twitter to have? Uh, or... hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I was thinking, is there Sorry, any way to have the the chat widget from Adobe Connect on on top of the slides somehow, or um, some system like this? Sorry. Yes, we may have this uh, this but uh, no, I think uh, you, you are right about this. I don't know if you you think if any. So, for instance, you in Berlin, we who raise the idea. Do you think that using Facebook to raise the question or the question board would be okay also? Did you understood me? Did you? Did you understand me? Basically, IRC or yeah. whatever it could be. Google Hangouts. Chat.
uh, this is to invest via MRI to a way of use the question board or, or the better. So, I, I, uh, think, I think we can. I think we can try the messaging board next week, for example, if you want to. It should be, should be possible. Uh, you, yeah. No, I think uh, that uh, if you don't have a, um, I think uh, we actually we got some, some nice suggestions, and uh, I don't know if you have uh, any other uh, issue to raise. Which is in the spirit of the town hall meeting. So the idea is we we we, we would like to have a, a more uh, easygoing um, and interactive uh, flow of, of election because uh, they are interdisciplinary. So this means that uh, for every statement by a lecturer, uh, there will be about two thirds of the people not really understanding exactly what he or she is talking about. And this is an enormous opportunity for for, for learning because uh, you you can you are exposed to many different mindsets and you can draw a lot of information that should really trigger many inspire you. Know? But we are looking. The main idea of this lecture is to inspire you and to give you some idea about the embodied intelligence. So I don't know if you have any other uh, issue or. Otherwise, we can conclude. I can give back the control to Plim to conclude the rest of the If there are not okay, any thank other. You. Thank you very much. Um, so, Mr. All the comments. Um, I'd say thank you uh, to everyone for participating. I think we had a nice, uh, very interactive lecture. Um, looking forward to next week. Um, and as, as always, we're, we'll be we'll be back uh, at uh, 9 CET on Thursday. So hope you hope to see you all then. So goodbye and see you next week.